Okay. Okay, guys, how's everything? Sorry. All right. Well, you can see my closet. Let me know if you can hear the cars. If so, I'll put my earplugs on. Shalom al Ghaziza. Again, I'm not connected to the router, the modem, not corrected, connected, not connected to the router, to the modem, because so far the internet has been fabulous. So we trust by the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God, that the internet will stay strong in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Father, be glorified. Son of God, be glorified. Holy Spirit, be glorified. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Teat the flesh and drink the blood of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, by coming to him in faith and trust and obedience by the power of the Spirit. Father, we love you. Son of God, Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, I ask that you bless this session. Anoint me in the words of my mouth to speak truth without error. Please, my Father, for the glory of Jesus Christ, save me from confusion. Save me from stammering and misinterpretation and enable me to recall all the passages by the power of the Holy Spirit and interpret them correctly by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father. And Father, please destroy all distractions of Satan. Destroy all the attacks of Satan. Cover us with the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus, and cleanse our hearts, Father. Cleanse the desires of our heart. Cleanse our minds, Father. Cleanse the thoughts of our minds, our souls, our spirits, our mouths, the words of our mouths, our tongues, and the holy blood of the Lord Jesus. Cleanse and purify us completely, inwardly and outwardly, and sanctify us by your Spirit, Father. Please, my Father, I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, destroy our fears and our doubts, our unbelief, not to be afraid of what Satan may bring against us. Shield us, Father. Give us faith to move mountains. Perfect trust in Jesus, knowing that Christ is risen. He is almighty. He is alive. He is Lord, and he loves us. He's in love with us. Give us the grace to be in love with him. Bless everyone here, Father. Abba, Avina, bless everyone here, Father. By the power of your Holy Spirit, bless them with wisdom, Father, with knowledge, with insight and understanding, those who are the household of God, the household of faith, strengthen them in your faith. Strengthen me, strengthen us by your spirit. Remove the veil from our eyes to plunge the depth of scripture, to bring out the meat of scripture, Father, for the glory of Jesus, so that Jesus increases in us. Please, Father, that we'll become more like Jesus, crucify our flesh, become less like the world, overcome our sinful passions that jesus will be magnified he will live his life in and through us for his glory by the power of the almighty eternal holy spirit father we love you father lord jesus we love you holy spirit we love you and if there are people here who are not unbelievers father take them captive by the power of the holy spirit and bring them to the feet of jesus and use me to glorify jesus christ and father i ask for the health i need to do this and the holiness not to disqualify myself. Save me from my flesh and hypocrisy to be a doer of your word, Father, that when no one's watching and only you are watching, that we still remain faithful to you, in love with you, obedient and holy and pure, and not succumbing to the flesh, but crucifying our flesh by the life and the power of your Holy Spirit. Please, Father. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. And Father, bless our loved ones. Bless those who are not saved, that they will be brought to salvation, such as Andrew Martin. Convict him, be a fire in his heart until he breaks and falls before the feet of Jesus. Please, Father, and be with our loved ones who are not with us, my daughters, Father. Watch over them and fill them with your spirit. Cover them with the blood of Jesus, and for their sake, bless me and save me from all harm for their sake, and bring them to me. For their, for their sake, Father, bring them to me so I can be in their lives, raising them up in the love of Jesus. And you know our needs, Father. Whoever has a need, if it's physical ailment, heal them. If it's emotional <clears throat> distress, heal them, Father. Mental anguish, heal them by the wounds of your Son, the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, by the life of your Spirit. We need you, Father. Save us from Satan and his children and from corrupt systems that seek to persecute us and cover over our sins in the past and that you'll remove them and the consequences of those sins, Father. 
so we can move forward and become more like Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit. Looking forward, heavenward, not behind, not <clears throat> to what is behind us, Father, to die to this world and live for you. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, heal Father, heal Lord Jesus, heal Holy Spirit, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically, and provide for us, my God. Okay, folks, uh, I think Hatun is finished, right? Again, I don't do this deliberately. I don't like to live stream when other Christians are live streaming. It's not competition. We're all brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and slaves of Jesus, but... I think she's finished, right? She finished her session? Okay. All right. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Problem is, unless we have Riaz. Is Riaz here? Is Riaz here? Oh, first last is here. Praise God. You're here. Because Protestant couldn't make it. He can post for us. Yep. When you say she's feeling some ill effects, what do you mean, brother? Uh, I don't know what you mean. If the noise is bothering you, let me know. Abbas was disgusting, everyone. I have no. Oh, by the way, there'll be no live streaming. There'll be no live streaming with David Wood. I don't know if you've heard. YouTube flagged one of his videos. YouTube flagged his video. Global persecution of Christians as hate speech. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? The YouTube video where he documents Christians being persecuted all over the world, suffering because they bear the name of Jesus Christ, got flagged yesterday for hate speech, and now he's deprived of YouTube privileges for a week. He cannot live stream for a week. So can you believe that? So even though we had planned to do a live stream after this, we can't do a live stream for a week some were suggesting he should come to my YouTube channel or we can do it on vocab, but it's not the same. The reason why it's not the same, because the Lord Jesus has blessed David and may the Lord Jesus continue to bless him and prosper him, continue to bless all of us and prosper us and save us from Satan trying to stop us. May the Lord Jesus rebuke him and that no one will stop us, but the Lord Jesus will fight for us and keep us doing ministry as long as he gives us the health and holiness to do so. When he does a live stream, like yesterday, we had about 1,900. Right. When we do a live stream now, by the grace of God, I'm getting over 200 glory to God, but it's not the same. So we're going to have to wait for a week. Can you believe that? Satan is going to attack, folks, even before I began Satan tried to attack me and unnerve me emotionally. So, guys, please, please, you know, Jesus is Lord. He's risen. And, you know, the spirit realm is real. Please, I beg you for the sake of Jesus covenant with us. Pray daily for us even fast, and ask your prayer warriors and churches to pray for us, right? Pray for miraculous protection upon us, that the door of ministry that God has opened to use us will never be shut, but God will shut the door on the faces of our enemies so they won't hinder us, and God will provide for us and the blessings that he's given us. He'll preserve them and pray for our families because our families are under attack. You guys don't underestimate how real the spiritual battle is. Daily, it's a battle. If it's not a battle with our own flesh and our passions that we try to crucify, it's a battle with agents of the devil who, unbeknownst to them, are using being used of the devil to attack us and discourage us, right? So please pray for us. So Lord willing, we're going to try to finish. Here's my goal. If you go to my YouTube channel, I hope you've subscribed and do hit the like button. On my YouTube channel, I've done multi-part series on Hebrews chapter 1. I've done multi-part series on the Lord Jesus Christ being Jehovah God Almighty, not the Archangel Michael in respect to Michael being a spirit creature. Now, why am I saying this? As the Lord Jesus loosens my tongue to speak clearly. And I pray, Lord Jesus, will bless the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears because it's surely not pleasing to my ears, okay? <clears throat> you have groups that will say Jesus is the Archangel Michael, but he's not a creature. We're not talking about them. I'm talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses who say 
Jesus is the Archangel Michael, and as the Archangel Michael, he is a creature, the first of Jehovah's creation. If you go to my YouTube channel and you search Michael, I've done a multi-part series proving Jesus is not the spirit creature called Michael. He is God Almighty. He is uncreated. He's eternal, and he's one with the Father. So I want to now finish that series because now I'll have a multi-part series on Hebrews 1 and on Jesus being God Almighty and not this creature called Michael. And it will be archived on my YouTube channel. You can then go back and listen, re-listen, re-re-listen, <clears throat> take notes, upload them to your YouTube channels, and pass the links on to others to silence this blasphemous lie against the glory of Jesus Christ. Right? So I want to fully cover this issue and be done with it. Because Lord Jesus willing, if the Lord gives me health and the Lord plants me here and does not allow Satan to stop me from doing the glory, glorious work, this work that's glorious and that it seeks to bring glory to Jesus Christ, I will be doing other topics, some apologetic some theological some practical because i want to cover all bases as long as the holy spirit gives me wisdom and knowledge understanding to know what the bible teaches and empowers me to live it out and then proclaim it for the glory of christ right so now shimunian let, let's try this again thera theras mixer folks uh, i i don't understand why people come here and tell me what to do and pontificate like theras mixer Theris Mixer, do you want to be here for more than a minute? Do you want me to mix you up and send you on your merry way? I don't know. Don't let Satan distract us. Rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus. Guys, two things will definitely get you blocked from my channel. You blaspheme the triune God and his word, you're gone. You justify abortion, which is murder murdering unborn innocent children you're gone and i've given the mods here full authorization they have my permission to block anyone that they deem block worthy that are distracting okay so with that said let's begin guys please i i tell you to remind me to give you articles before i end the session but what happens is people forget and i forget there are some articles i want to give you so you can either upload or just you can save the links and read the information so that you can use it and teach others for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay? So pray. And guys, let me remind you again. Please pray for the apologists. I need your prayers. My daughters need your prayers. Right? Hater Wood, as much as I dislike him, needs your prayers. Look, Acts 17 ap Apologetics. He should send his 1,700 board uh, what do they call it the people that come and get bored to my channel because he won't be able to do any live streams for a week okay so with that said pray for us we need god's miraculous protection i definitely need it it's tiring folks it's been over two years i'm still not completely free pray for complete freedom by the power of the holy spirit by the blood of jesus christ free from all hindrances to glorify christ okay now with that said Remind me to give you some links because we're going to unpack Hebrews 1. Are we ready now? With that as a backdrop, as a warm-up to prepare you, trusting the Spirit to fill me, to bless you, and the Spirit to fill you for the glory of Christ. We're going to show why Jesus cannot be an angelic creature. Let me emphasize. Jesus cannot be an angelic creature. Let me see if I can bring this one article up now. See, it's a response to Joe's witness. Maybe I can. Jesus cannot be an angelic creature. Let's see if I found it here. Oh, yep, here it goes. I think this would be it. All right. Here it is. Here's an article. Let me give it to you right now. Let me give you this article right now. Guys, save this article, please. Click on it. Save it. Print it. Put it in your bookmarks study the material until it becomes second nature and teach others okay that's one article for now now 
What do I mean that Jesus cannot be an angelic creature? Jesus cannot be an angelic creature. Okay. Someone had brought this objection several streams ago. Don't I believe that Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord? The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? Yes, absolutely. Then why am I now saying that Hebrews 1 shows that Jesus cannot be an angel? Are you guys listening? I'm trusting the Spirit to just grant you the grace to understand and grant me clarity to help you understand and bring the people in for the glory of Christ. Okay. Do I believe Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? That specific angel, that specific angel sent by God who claims to be God, claims to do things that only God can do, and is worshipped as God. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ, and the ancient church believed that was Jesus Christ. Then how is it I'm saying right now, and this is where you got to listen, so you learn how to address this objection if it comes up. How is it right now I'm saying that Hebrews 1 clearly teaches Jesus is not an angel? Is that not a contradiction? And I hope my precious sister Louise is here. I hope that I can be used of God to bless her and every one of you. Right? How is that not a contradiction? Well, very easy. When I say Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord, here again, I'm going to sound like a broken record because we're creatures of repetition. We have to repeat things over and over again until it becomes second nature. By the way, the Injil, do you know that's a cuss word? Injil, my, my brother in Christ. I'm, I'm thinking you're a brother in Christ. You know that word is a cuss word in the Jamaican language? That is a bad word. Don't use a bad word when you have a title that identifies you as a Christian. You know that, right? Don't do that. Don't be used of the devil to distract, rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus, and seek the blood of Christ to cover you. Okay? Now, with that said, yeah, it's a very bad word. It is a nasty word. And I know that because I used to work with a Jamaican when I was a chef, a cook, as a chef's assistant. And he told me that's a bad word. Look, look at look at the sinful nature of Lisa. Lisa, your sinful nature is eating you up, right? Yeah. Hey, tell me. What? What word? So you want me to repeat the bad word, Lisa? But okay, Lisa, let me repeat it. Okay, let me repeat it for you. I just got done, Lisa, my precious sister who loves Jesus, and I love you for the sake of the Lord. I just got done saying, don't say that word. And you ask me what word, which means you want me to either spell it or repeat it. Why would I want to tell you what that word is? Because you know why, Lisa? We still have that sinful nature, that sinful tendency that arises trying to make us succumb to it because it can't control us anymore because we've been set free by the Spirit. So, Lisa, that's what it is. Your, your flesh, your sin. Yeah, what's that word? I need to know. I need to know. Here, I need to know. Okay? It's okay. Yeah, because you know, why would you ask me what it is? <laughs> Sorry. It's okay, Lisa. I don't care what they say about you, your precious sister. Okay, with that said, with that said, hold on, let me tell this guy I'm teaching right now. Hold on. Let me send him this link. It's my precious tax guy. I think he's precious anyway. One second, folks. Sorry about that. It's what happens when you're live. We were saying in Lala on a moonlight day. Let's see if I can do this. Do it as Brutus. Let me see. Okay. All right. With that said, let me get back to it. See, guys, don't let the enemy distract us. Focus for the glory of Jesus because I don't want to make these sessions longer than necessary. No, sorry, Christian. I didn't eat everything I made. Sorry, let's get off topic and talk about cooking. Okay, now, focusing on this. What's the difference between Jesus being the angel of the Lord with Hebrews 1 saying that Jesus cannot possibly be an angel? Guys, if you don't listen, you won't learn the difference. You won't know how to refute this objection and see there is no contradiction. So, guys, please, for your sake so you can benefit, help me to help you because I want you to know your faith and live it out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, 
The term angel, how are you, sister? The term angel in Hebrew is malach. And we've said this in previous sessions, even in articles we've written, when I say we, Anthony, myself, and others. The word in Greek, and you have people here who speak Greek, is angelos, and angelos, angelos. I like, I'm trying to sound like a Greek, native Greek speaker. It's not going to work. The Greek word angelos and malach means messenger, means messenger, messenger. That's all it means. Now, depending on the context, an angel, a messenger can be a human messenger, a human angel. And the Old and New Testaments use the term for angel for human beings. And they're obviously creatures or it can refer to a spirit messenger. A spiritual being from heaven sent by God as his messenger. Gabriel and Michael are spirit messengers. So when you say the archangel Michael, you're basically saying the chief messenger Michael. That's all archangel means. Archangel means chief messenger Michael. But what kind of messenger? A spirit one. So... What's the difference then between Jesus being the messenger of God and the messengers or angels of Hebrews 1? The difference is Hebrews 1 is speaking of created spirit messengers, angelic creatures, spirit creatures created to be messengers, angels of God. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is not a creature. He isn't created. He's not a creature created to be a messenger. He's eternal. He's uncreated. He's God Almighty, sent by God to be a messenger for God. Do you understand the difference now? Do you understand the difference? If you don't get this difference, you're not going to learn. Okay. Jesus is an angel, but not a created one. Hebrews 1 is talking about created angels, spirit creatures who were created to be messengers by their very nature. Jesus, on the other hand, is a messenger by function. He's not a creature created to be a messenger. He's the eternal son, God Almighty, who assumes the role of a messenger. I want to make sure you get this point. And let me give you the article again. Here's one article. Do not leave the session and do not let me end the session until I give you all these links. Okay? Okay, thank you, Jai. Well, pray the Lord blesses me, Jai, with clarity of speech and thought so I can bless you. So did everyone understand what I just said? What's the difference? Jesus is not a creature created to be a messenger. He's not a spirit creature who is created to be a messenger by nature. Jesus is the eternal son, God Almighty, uncreated by nature, who assumes the role of a messenger. Okay. Hebrews 1 is talking about spirit creatures who were created to be messengers. Right? They were created for that purpose. They were created to be messengers, serving God and serving man, specifically those redeemed in Christ. Right? Does everyone get it? Before I delve into the topic. If you understand the distinction, believe me when I say, not because I'm smart, believe me when I tell you, the arguments I'm giving you, we have used it in spiritual battle. Spiritual battle. These are battle-tested arguments, perfected, refined by the Spirit. And I'm telling you, they are irrefutable. Do you know why they're irrefutable? Because by the grace of God, we have the truth. It is easy to defend the truth when you know it. The Trinity is true because the God who exists, who created all things, is triune. The Trinity is God, the Trinity lives, and the Bible is revelation of the Trinity. So if you're on the side of truth, you can't be refuted. 
You cannot refute truth. You cannot defeat truth. The triune God lives. He is truth. And the Bible is the inspired record of the God who is. And that God happens to be Father, Son, and Spirit. The reason why Trinitarians get defeated is because they don't know the truth of Scripture. They don't know the biblical foundation for the Trinity. And they're not able to articulate it. Once you know the biblical basis for the Trinity, understand it, and are able to articulate it, no one can refute you because you can't refute truth. God, by his very nature, is truth. And the God who is true is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. So you can't be refuted. This is why if you listen to these streams, read our articles, I promise you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, who raised up men and women, illuminating them, not inspiring them. We are not inspired the way the Bible writers were. God forbid anyone would even suggest that. Illuminating us to understand the inspired scriptures he produced through holy men to give you arguments we've used in the battle, spiritual battle, that have been refined and perfected by the almighty spirit of the living God, the eternal spirit of the Father and Son, who himself happens to be God and one with the Father and the Son. Right? You with me there? So how do I know the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is not a creature, but he is God, sent by God. So there's a distinction in the Godhead there to be the messenger of God. So the angel of the Lord, this particular angel of the Old Testament, is God, sent by God, showing there's a distinction in the Godhead. They're not two gods, right? Because God is one. And this God is sent to be the messenger of the one God that sent him. How do I know this angel is not a creature? Let me give you some of the evidence. Some. I'll just give you two examples so we can go into Hebrews 1. Exactly, Bess. Are we ready now? Let me just give you two examples showing, showing this particular angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is not a creature. He is God Almighty, distinct from God, sent by that one God to be his messenger, who claims to be God and whom others realize is God appearing before them in visible form, oftentimes as a human being and worthy of their worship. Are we ready? Are we ready for the evidence? I'll just give you two for the sake of time. Who's ready? Jump on board. Let's go to Genesis 31, verses 10 to 13. Now, folks, if you go to my YouTube channel, I have a multi-part series on the Trinity in the Old and New Testaments. And I have sessions, more than one, on the angel of the Lord. So if you want to go deeper, go to my YouTube channel and the search engine, put angel of the Lord. I have several sessions on the angel of the Lord being God almighty, not a creature who happens to be Jesus Christ. Now, Genesis 31 verses 10 to 13. I know first last was here. I hope he's not last. I want him to be first. Is he here? Because he'll post. Let me know if the noise is, is bothering you because the air conditioning's on and I'll put on my earplugs. He left? All right. Okay, Genesis 31, 10 to 13. I don't know what happened at first last. He was here. He disappeared. Thank you, Alan. Alan's going to post, so read with me, guys. Oh, okay, read with me. And it came to pass. Thank you, Brother Alan. And it came to pass that at the time that the cattle conceived, this is Jacob speaking, Jacob, that I lifted up mine eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring straight. Ring, ring straight. Okay? Now watch, watch what Jacob says. Watch what Jacob says. Okay? Speckled and gristled. Now notice verse 11. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here am I. Folks, pay attention. Jacob realizes it's the angel of God speaking to him. The angel of God appeared to me in a dream, and he spoke to me. The angel of God appeared to me in a dream, and he spoke to me. Now watch. Watch what happens. Jacob said, here, here am I. Now watch what happens. Let's read. Okay. And he said, lift up now thine eyes 
and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled, and gristled. Now, I don't have time to explain the background. There's a lot of meat and practical application that goes with interpreting this section. I don't have time for that. Lord willing, in the near future, I will unpack the significance of this dream, the context of the dream, and how you can derive hope and comfort from what Jacob experienced, practical application. But I can't do it right now. Let's just focus on the point that the angel is God. Notice Jacob says, I know that was the angel. It was the angel of God who appeared to me in the dream and spoke to me. And he said to me, lift up now in thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled and gristled. For I have seen, I, I have seen all that Lebanon, your father-in-law, doeth unto thee. I have seen how he's misused you, oppressed you, and persecuted you. I've seen your affliction at his hands, him oppressing you. And because I've seen what he's done to you, I've come to your aid and your deliverance. That's what he's telling him. Now notice 13. Notice 13. Guys, let this shock you. The angel is speaking. Notice 13 what he says. The angel speaks in 13. He goes, I've seen what Lebanon has done to you. I've seen how he's oppressed you and afflicted you. And I've come to your aid, to your salvation. Why? Why did I come to your aid? Why did I come to save you? Verse 13. I am the God of Bethel. Bethel is composed of two words. Beth, house, il, house of God. The angel has the audacity to say to Jacob, I am the God of the house of God. What house? The house that you erected for God. I am the God of the house of God. That house belongs to me. I am the God of that house. Where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vow, vowest a vow unto me, made a vow unto me, now arise, get thee out of, from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. Did you catch it? Yeah, we have another moron. We have another brain dumbass of the devil, Arcturus, who again exposes his stupidity and why the Bible is dangerous in his hand and should have no business touching the Bible because he's an idiot saying, no, Jesus doesn't manifest as an angel. Okay, did you guys catch it there? Do you see the angel claims to be the God of the house of God? Now, write down, and you can read at your own leisure. I'm not going to quote it. Genesis 28, verses 10 to 22. Genesis 28, verses 10 to 22 Jacob was at a place called Luz. He put his head on a rock, a stone, to sleep. The stone became his pillow. As he's sleeping, he had a dream. He saw what we now call Jacob's ladder. Genesis 28, 10 to 22, not 1 to 22. Genesis 28, 10 to 22. Okay? He saw in his dream what we call Jacob's ladder. The term Jacob's ladder comes from Genesis 28, 10 to 22. You don't need to post it on rule. It's too long. I'm just going to sum it up. Now, it's not a ladder as you think. This is called a ziggurat because archaeologists have uncovered buildings with a winding staircase. So imagine a huge building and had a staircase that went around it to took you to the top. A ziggurat. So we know what Jacob's ladder is. It's not a ladder as you know it. It would be a building... A very big building, a huge building, with a staircase that goes around and takes you to the top, right? A ziggurat. So Jacob sees angels going down and going up, and on top of it, he sees Jehovah. That's Genesis 28, 10 and 22. Don't take my word for it. He sees Jehovah standing there, and Jehovah promising Jacob that I will guard you, I will protect you, I will preserve you, and I'll bring you back to your father's land. Now, Jacob wakes up, and he's astonished. He wakes up, and he's astonished at what he just saw, and he called the place Bethel. He goes, surely God is in this place. Let's look at Genesis 28, 17. Look what he says. Genesis 28, 17. Pray I'm not a distraction to my neighbors, but a blessing. Genesis 28, 17. Watch here.
Genesis 28, 17. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So then what did he do? He took that stone and left it there as a marker, a reminder. This is where I saw God in a dream. And he poured oil over it and anointed it. And he called the place beth -il, house of God, because he saw Jehovah God appearing visibly in a dream. And then he made a vow to God. If you continue reading, read at your own leisure. I'm just summing it up. But trust me, that's what it says. He made a vow to God. He's saying, if you deliver me and return me back to my father's place, my father's house, you'll be my God and I'll give you a tenth, a tithe of all that I have. So that was his deal. He goes, here's the deal. You protect me. You guard me and bring me back to my father's house. You'll be my God. I'll give you a tithe. That's the context of Genesis 31, verses 10 to 13. Jacob was being oppressed, lied to, deceived by his father-in-law, Lebanon. Lebanon was robbing him of his wages. So the angel appeared to him and says, look, I'm keeping my end of the bargain. Do you remember that dream where you told God that he'd be your God if he saved you from your affliction and you'd give him a tithe? If he saved you from your affliction and brought you safely back to your father's home? Well, here I am. I see your affliction. I see your oppression. And I'm now living up to my end of the bargain. I am the God that you made that vow to. I am your God to save you and protect you and deliver you to keep my end of the bargain. Now you need to keep your end of the bargain. That's what the angel just said. You understand who the angel is now? The angel claims to be that Jehovah God, that Jehovah God that appeared to him at Bethel in a dream and promised to deliver him where Jacob then made a vow. If you pro deliver me, you'll be my God and I'll give you a tithe. The angel says, I am that God. I am your God. I am the God of the house of God. Who does this angel think he is? Exactly, Jesus the promise keeper. So this angel claims to be God. Check carefully throughout the Old Testament, New Testament. A mere angelic creature, an angel that's created, never calls himself God, never accepts worship due to God, and no one identifies him as God. But this angel calls himself God, does things that only God can do, is called God by others and is worshipped as God and he accepts it. Yep, the man that Jacob wrestled with is Jesus. Right? Let me show you the difference between this angel and angelic creatures. Revelation 22 verses 8 to 9. Revelation 22 verses 8 to 9. Pay attention, folks. You're getting a lot of meat right now, folks. I'm trying to give you meat and make it as simple as possible for you to understand so it's accessible, so you can use it for the glory of Christ. Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9. Watch here. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. An angel, right? Then saith he unto me, notice what the angel's response is. See thou do it not. Don't you dare worship me. For I am thy fellow servant. I'm only a servant like you. Your fellow servant, a fellow slave of God. And of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So folks, help me understand, why does this angelic creature say, don't you worship me? I'm a slave like you, a fellow slave, with your brothers, the prophets. We all worship God. But that angel that appeared to Jacob, I am the God of the house of God. You vowed to me when you vowed to Jehovah. And I'm keeping my end of the bargain to save you. Zena, if you show me that, I'll give you $50 million in the Old Testament where this particular angel of the Lord refuses to be worshipped. Zena, I'll give you $50 million and I will restore 
the Khilafa. So I can be the Khalifa. You with me there? Now let me show you where this angel of God is worshipped. Numbers 22, 32 to 33. Numbers 22, 32 to 33. You said Old Testament, right? Well, I just gave you the New Testament, Zina. Zina, are you reading with me, sister? Hold on. My poor sister, she's still a little discombobulated from her previous Muslim days. Sister, did I not just read Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9, where the angel said, don't worship me? So now you're really confusing me. I'm hoping that you're following on because I want to help you, but I'm baffled. Why'd you ask me? Don't you find somewhere where an angel said, don't worship me, when we just got done reading it and quoting it? Or am I having a meltdown and a shutdown? Numbers 22, 32 to 33. Numbers 22, verses 32 to 33. Johannes, you know I'm going to have to send you back to Iraq again, right? Because you don't stop with these questions. Numbers 22, 32 to 33. Okay. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass? Why, Balaam, did you strike your ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand you, to oppose you, to stop you, because thy way is perverse before me, because you're perverted before me. Now notice... 33, folks, 33. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. Now notice who it is. The angel says, you're perverted before me, and I was about to kill you dead, but your ass saved you. But now notice 31. Notice it's the angel speaking. And Balaam realizes it's the angel. But when he realizes it's the angel, notice verse 31 what he does. Notice what he does in 31. Watch, folks. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and bowed down his head and fell fa flat on his face. Why does this angel allow people to fall flat on their face before his feet in worship in submission, in obeisance. But that angel in John said, don't you do it. I'm just a slave like you. Worship God. You caught it? And notice this angel appears in human form. How do I know human form? Because when Balaam's eyes were open, he saw his hand holding a sword. So it's a human form. And he has a sword in his hand by which he slays God's enemies. So the angel appears in human form with a sword that he uses to slay God's enemies. And when his eyes were opened to see that which is invisible to our eyes, unless God removes the veil, and he saw the angel in human form, he fell flat at his feet. Zina, it's okay. You and me are going to revive the Khilafah. Sister. Okay. Let me give you another example. That's not a stupid question. And Loie, uh, Lois, I promise you, if you subscribe to my channel and do a search, I did a series on the angel of the Lord, and I proved that one of the three men that appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18 is Jesus Christ as God Almighty. So go and feast on the sessions. You'll have a feast. Now, with that said, let me give you another example. Joshua 5, verses 13 and 15. Joshua 5, verses 13 and 15. Okay, Joshua 5, verses 13 and 15. Right. Thank you, Alan, for helping me to help you. Joshua 5, verses 13 and 15. How do I answer burning lion? Yeah, I'm angry. Sai Christian, you got to pray for me, brother. I know you're telling me be patient. And... Where do these guys come up with Metatron? Burning lion. You're going to get burned all right. I'm, the only way you're going to stay in this channel, burning lion, hold on, hold on. Don't post anything. I want you to quote a single verse in the Old Testament which mentions Metatron. Because Burning Lion, I'm going to have to send you on your merry way for that. Show me Metatron anywhere in the Old Testament. Genesis 
the level, I'm sorry, guys. I hope you don't get upset at me, and please forgive me, and may the Lord have mercy on me. The level of stupidity among some of our Christian brothers and sisters, it's, it's shocking and it's disgusting. Why would someone tell me, is that Jesus or is that Metatron? I am so insulted by that question, I'm offended by it. You come up with a rabbinic fictional character called Metatron and ask me whether it's Metatron or Jesus. Yeah, like Ronnie said, do me a favor, stop watching the Transformers because you're going to be transformed, actually transported from one YouTube channel to another. <laughs> somebody want to be in a butter. Somebody want to be in a butter. Somebody want to be in a butter. Somebody, somebody. That's Sai Christian. Sai Christian. Do you blame me, brother? A Christian wants to sound informed and intelligent. See, brother, I know about Metatron. See, I'm studied. Ooh, ooh, yeah. Ooh, ooh, look at me. Metatron. And I bet many people don't. No, no. Actually, when you mention Metron, you show me that you're an idiot, brother. What? Show you how to answer the question, brother. What? What question is there for me to answer? What Metatron? Sorry, folks. That's why I'll never be as popular as David because David is a crowd pleaser, and he tickles ears. That's why he gets two thousand people. What Metatron? Why? Why am I going to need to answer a question? That shouldn't be posed in the first place. Yeah, maybe Megatron. We can talk about Megatron and the Transformers. Now, folks, Joshua 5, 13 and 15. Joshua 5, 13 and 15. Thank you, Indicator. Thank you, Alan. Read with me. And it came to pass, guys, read this. Joshua 5, 13 and 15. Read with me. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. Notice, he sees a man, a human figure with a sword, like the angel of the Lord, appears as a human figure in a human body with a sword in his hand. Okay, watch. Behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Are you fighting for me or are you fighting for my enemies? Notice the answer. Guys, notice the answer by this man. And I'm going to show you Jesus Christ in a minute. And he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord. No, I'm neither for you nor against you. Pay attention. I'm not for you nor against you. You're going to see why that's meat. I'm not for you nor against you. I'm the commander of the host of the Lord. I command the armies of God. The armies of God in heaven, on earth, under my command, I rule them. His heavenly armies, his earthly armies, under my authority. So as the commander of the host of the Lord, am I now come? Now notice what Joshua does. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And said unto him, what saith my Lord unto a servant? Wow. You are my Lord. I am your servant slave. And I bow down and worship to you. Now notice 15, what he says. Notice 15, what he says. And the captain of the Lord so said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from thy foot, from off thy foot. Remove your shoes from me. For the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Wow! Did you catch it? The commander, the captain of the army of the Lord says, I don't fight for you, nor do I fight against you. I command God's armies in heaven and earth. I command you. You fight for me. You're my servant, my slave, doing my bidding. Joshua falls before him on his face in worship and says, You are my Lord. I'm your servant. I'm here to do what you want. And then he says, Well, the first thing you do is remove your sandals from my presence because where I stand, that's sacred ground. Don't defile it with your stinking shoes. No, it wasn't God who said it. Bach Kumuzi. It was the angel of the Lord who said it to Moses. And that angel is God, but not God the Father. Okay, are you with me there? Because I'm not done yet. Oop, hold on. My, my computer, I got to charge it. It's about to die. 
Well, Zina, you will understand it if you just follow. Hold on. Zina, what do you think you're here for? You want to know the Bible, right? And when you seek wisdom, God and his love reveals it to you. How? Either just by reading scripture, he'll illuminate you, or use teachers to illuminate you by the Spirit. So you will learn the Bible better than me. All you need to do, Zina, is be patient. Take this in slowly but surely. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you take it in and understand it, and you will know it. Why do you think you're here, Zina? God answers the prayers and the desires of those who want to know him. God, I want to know you, and I want to know your word, because I want to fall in love with you as you are and worship you for who you are, and then God answers you. Either when you read the scriptures, he'll illuminate you directly or guide you to the right human instruments used by the Spirit to then teach you the depth and the beauty of Scripture. And that's why you're here. So this shows two things. It's a blessing to me that you're here. Why? Because God loves you and knows your heart and wants you to learn. And so he will not misguide you. The fact that you brought, brought you here to learn from me, that also gives me hope because I'm a fallen, imperfect human sinner that struggle, struggles, Right? with my own worthiness or lack thereof. So when someone like you, like you comes here and is being fed, that's God also telling me, in spite of your imperfections, I love you, Sam, and I will wash you in the blood of Jesus and change you to be like Christ and seal you by the Spirit because you're mine forever. So you're blessing me as I'm blessing you. Because God will not bring you to a false shepherd a wayward shepherd, a false teacher. He loves you too much to let that happen to you. So you guys understand you're blessing me. Don't think I'm just blessing you. If you've been seeking God and you've been praying, God, please guide me. I want to know your word. You end up here. You are now giving me assurance. The Lord is speaking through you guys. Sam, even though you are a sinner and you fail me, your desire is not to fail. I don't want to fail you, Lord. You are in my hand. You are my instrument. And I will perfect you and sanctify you to make you more like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to be in love with Jesus, and to glorify Jesus until you come to, to home to me or Jesus comes down. So you're blessing me. Because, folks, just a side note, don't think I don't have struggles. I don't have issues. I don't have sinful passions that I wrestle with. I don't have drama that causes me at times not faltering in my faith of God. I have absolutely no doubt God is real. Jesus is alive. That I have absolute assurity of. But my doubts come when, Lord, will I be delivered from this trial? Are you going to allow me to go through this trial? And am I going through this trial because you're going to punish and discipline me because of my sin to my shame? I have those struggles too because I'm human. You get my point? So when you come here after you've been seeking God's face, you know what that is, Zena? God is telling you, Zena, I'm answering the desire of your heart. You're going to know who I am, know my word, and fall in love with me. And this is an sign of me. Sam, you are my instrument in this generation. To make Jesus known by the power of the Holy Spirit so people fall in love with Jesus. Thank you, my Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Please give me favor and save me from my calamities. So it's a two-way street. It's a two-way blessing. Is it not? So God is answering you. Don't wish that you'll know the Bible like me. You are learning the Bible like me, and you're going to know it better than me. And live it out. For the glory of Christ. So you're being answered. That's why you're here. Just pray with pray with me and pray for me and put up with my imperfections. Right? Because I'm a work in progress. Now, with that said, as you're focusing, okay, if you're focusing, did you notice this man that appeared to Joshua? How amazing this man is? Notice several things about him. He appears in human form and he has a sword in his hand, right? He is worshipped. Joshua falls before him on his face, calls him my Lord, Adonai, and says, I'm your servant, your slave, so that Joshua realized 
He is my commander. He is my Lord. He is my sovereign. He doesn't fight for me. I fight for him because he owns me and commands me and the armies of Israel and the armies of heaven. And he's worthy of my worship. And this man says, remove your sandals from my presence. In my presence, remove them. Because where I am, wherever my feet touch, becomes sacred ground. Remove your filthy sandals from my presence. Okay. Why am I unpacking this? Okay. I want you to show you who this man is. I want to show you who this man is. This man is the angel of God. How do I know? Make the connection. Make the connection with Balaam. When Balaam saw the angel of God, the veil was removed. He saw the angel of God in human form. He saw the angel of God with a sword in his hand. And like the captain, Balaam fell before the angel of God on his face in worship. So notice the connection between the captain and the angel. The angel and the captain appear in human form and have swords in their hands by which they slay God's enemies. The angel and the captain demand worship and receive worship. And another connection between the angel and the captain. Remember what the captain said? He said to him, remove your sandals from my presence because this ground has become sacred and holy. Let me show you what the angel says to Moses. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, specifically verse 5. Exodus chapter 3, Verses 1 to 6, specifically verse 5. Alan, you're too excited. I know my brother from a different mother. You got too excited now. You're hyperventilating. I didn't say verse 5. Exodus 3, verses 1 to 6. Because if you go to 5, you're not making my case. How do you know it's the angel? Exodus 3, verses 1 to 6, Alan. Because I know you kept saying 5, 5. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's read. Exodus 3, verses 1 to 5. We're going to include 6 too, Alan. All the way to six. Who appeared to Moses? Guys, read. Who appeared to Moses? Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now, notice who appears to Moses. And the angel of the Lord appeared. Oh, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Who appeared to him? The angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. Let me repeat it again. The angel of the Lord was appearing to him. But now, guys, read. Three and four. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Wait, it said the angel was in the bush. But it says now God is in the bush calling him from the bush. So the angel is God. This God that's appearing is the angel. So the God that's appearing is the angel. The angel is God and this God is the angel, not the father. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Now watch what the angel who is God, the angel who is God. What does he say in verse five? And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. <whistles> now notice verse six. Thank you, Steve. God bless you, my brother. Notice verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Guys, I'm blown away. Exodus 3 says, it's the angel of God that appeared as fire out of the bush. But then it says, God spoke out of the bush. And Moses heard the voice of God. And that voice told him, remove your sandals from my presence. And Moses was afraid because he realized I'm looking at God in visible form. But Exodus 3, 2 says that's the angel. So are you making the connection between the angel and the captain of the Lord's army? The angel, like the captain, appears in human form. 
The angel, like the captain, has a sword by which he slays God's enemies. The angel, like the captain, is worshipped as God. The angel, like the captain, demands their servants, their subjects, to move their sandals from their presence. Why? Because the angel is the captain. The captain is the angel. Right? Did that sink in? Making sense before I move on? I want to give you a minute for it to sink in. So who is the captain of the army of the Lord? He's the angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? The captain of the army of the Lord. The captain of the army of the Lord is the angel of the Lord. The angel of God is the captain of the army of the Lord. They're the same person. Yes, he was there with the Father, Christos. And the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, it wasn't just the angel. It was God and his angel together in the cloud. So, yes, the Father and the Son. Christos. Thomas, if you got here, rewind. Start listening till you catch up to the present. It's Joshua 5, verses 13 and 15. Joshua 5, verses 13 and 15. No, that's not there, Andrew. He's talking about where does it say captain? You know, it's Sparta, chief. Aye, aye, captain. Joshua 5, verses 13 and 15. So did everyone see that Joshua 5, verses 13 and 15, that captain of the army of the Lord is the angel of God? Did I make the case there? Or you're still not seeing it? Because now I'm going to show you it's Jesus. I'm going to show you it's Jesus. If there's someone still not getting it, let me know. Because now I'm going to show you it's Jesus. Let's go back to Joshua 5.13. Because now I'm going to prove to you that one is Jesus Christ appearing to them as the Father's messenger in human form who claims to be God, does things that only God can do, whom others realize this is God in human form, in visible form, worthy of our worship. Okay, now Joshua 5.13, watch here. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? A man appearing in human form with a sword. Who is he? Verse 14. Verse 14. Who is he? Watch, I'm going to show you it's Jesus. But bear with me. I'm going to walk you through this. Verse 14, and he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord. The word host is the term the Bible uses for the armies of God, whether his heavenly armies, meaning his angelic warriors, or his earthly armies, like Israel, fighting for God. He goes, I'm the captain of God's armies in heaven on earth. The armies in heaven are under my authority. The armies on earth under my authority. I am the Lord of the army in heaven. I rule over them, and I am the Lord of God's army on earth, meaning you, Joshua, and Israel. I am Lord over you. I tell you what to do. So he is the commander of the army of heaven. How do I know this is Jesus? According to the New Testament, who commands the armies of heaven? Who is the Lord of the armies of heaven? Who owns the army of heaven? Revelation 19 Verses 11 to 16. Revelation, Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. Watch here. Read with me now. Guys, read with me. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. But this is Jesus, the Word of God. It's not God the Father. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. He's leading the armies of heaven. He's their commander. They followed him, the leader, the commander who's in charge. And they were upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now watch, 15. Read with me, 15. 
and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. So he has a sword too, hmm. that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fiercest and wrath of Almighty God. And now notice his other title, Revelation 19, 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. There you go. Jesus, the word of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, leads the armies of heaven and owns them. Revelation 19, 19. Revelation 19, 19. Pay attention, guys. No side talking. Pay attention so you can learn. Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the king of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Jesus on the horse, and it's his army. He owns the armies. He commands the armies. He is Lord of the armies. He's the king over all kings and Lord over all lords. And if you still doubt it's Jesus, even though it says the word of God, which is the name of Jesus, Revelation 17, 14. Who is this word of God who's the king of kings, Lord of lords, who owns the armies of heaven? Revelation 17, 14. There shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The lamb, the word of God, is king of kings, lord of lords, and he owns the armies of heaven. So whom did Joshua see and worship? Whom did Moses see and worship? Jesus Christ, in his pre-human existence, before he was born as a baby from his blessed virgin mother, before he became an actual human by nature, appearing in the Old Testament in visible form as fire or in a pillar of cloud or pillar of fire by night or in human form, that was Jesus. See that? So who told Jacob, I am the God of the house of God, Jacob, where you anointed a pillar and vowed to me. The angel of God claimed to be the God of the house of God, the God of Jacob who would save him. But I just showed you that angel is Jesus. Lois. God by nature is bodiless. God by nature is spaceless. God can assume a human form, a shape, so you can see him. But by nature, he's bodiless. Hope that answers your question, Lois. With me there? The God who is bodiless and shapeless, who created all shape, all forms, all matter, can assume any shape and form that he created, but he by nature is shapeless and formless. And because he is shapeless and formless and almighty, he can manifest in a million different shapes and forms at the same time in different locations. So he can appear to you in the shape of a man, and he can appear in another place in the world at the same time in the shape of a lamb, and he can appear somewhere else in the shape of a dove, he can manifest various shapes and forms because he's bound to none of them. Okay? Now, did I make a case that Jesus is the angel of God, but not an angelic creature? Did I make that case? Jesus is the angel of God, but not an angelic creature. So you need to distinguish between two types of angels. Those angels that are created, like Michael and Gabriel and human beings, and this angel who's not created, who's the eternal son, God Almighty, assuming the role of an angel, messenger. Because if that made sense, I can now go to Hebrews 1. I can go to Hebrews 1. Did that make sense? Come on, Anna, you know the answer to the question. You're killing me. In the book of Revelation, Anna, how did Jesus appear to John? In his physical body or did he appear like a lamb? And then in another place in Revelation, he appeared like the Ancient of Days, an older person with white hair and a robe. 
So answer that question, Anna, for yourself. Okay, so you see, even though Jesus is a man with a physical body, as God, he can still manifest in different shapes and forms simultaneously the world over. That's why Jesus can appear to you as a little child, or he can appear to you as an elderly beggar to test you to see if you're going to care. And he can appear as a lamb or as a lion. He can appear in all these shapes and forms because as God, he can manifest multiple shapes and forms. Right? Guys, it's killing me that the churches are not teaching you basic theology. And I'm being honest. Why would you be shocked at that? Have you not read Revelation? In Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, Jesus appears as a young male baby lamb with seven horns and seven eyes that's alive. Are you telling me that Jesus has the, the body of a lamb? You serious? You don't know this? Or when Jesus manifests himself as the Ancient of Days, an older person, an elderly person with white hair and a white robe, and his eyes are like flame of fire. That's not Jesus' physical body that he has by virtue of being a man. That's Jesus assuming different shapes and forms. No, he has a true physical body because he's truly human and he'll never stop being human. But because he's God, though his physical body that's glorified is in heaven, physically and visibly, that body that's his, that he's attached to himself, as God, while his physical body's in heaven, he can appear in millions of places, in dreams and visions, and in time and space, in variety of visible forms. You want me there? Oh, the elves are here too? I didn't know that. It really does hurt me. It really does hurt me. Honestly, I say this out of love for you guys. The level of biblical illiteracy among Christians because churches are not doing their job. It is, you understand why we're under judgment, right? You understand why evil is spreading like cancer and Christians are being persecuted and darkness is becoming stronger and stronger because that's God's way of allowing the church to suffer the consequences of its laziness and compromise and biblical illiteracy. Right? Folks, put it this way. About 200 years ago in America, if someone was caught in adultery, they would be punished, not the other spouse. Now you can commit an adultery like it's going out of style. You get the right lawyers and a corrupt judge, and the innocent party gets punished and condemned and even thrown in jail if they could get away with it. You with me there? Okay. Do you understand now that Jesus is a man in heaven with a glorified physical body that he's attached to himself, a physical body that's deathless, indestructible, that he'll always possess. So right now in heaven, Jesus is seen as a glorified man with an actual physical body that is now immortal, that he's attached himself to, that body that was nailed, that he now raised and made immortal, that's his forever. But because he is God also, as God, He'll be in heaven in his physical body on the throne, a visible throne where in his physical glorified body he sits. And you see that physical body because he's truly human. But as God, he can appear multiple places in multiple ways, in multiple forms, while physically he's in heaven. You understand? How do you explain... Jesus appears differently in Revelation. In Revelation 1, he appears differently than in Revelation 5 because Jesus can change shapes and forms as God. But as man, he has a physical body that's now unchangeable, immortal, and deathless. 
He's the God man. You want me to show you that? Where Jesus appears in two different ways in Revelation? You want me to show you that too? You know, I'm going to have to do part three, right? <laughs> if you guys promise to come in with me and pray for me and my daughters, pray for miraculous protection. The doors of opposition slam shut on those who seek to hinder me, and God will give me freedom so I won't be hindered or shackled to glorify Christ. I'll keep teaching you, but my fate is in the hands of the Lord to give me favor here. Okay. Can I show you that in Revelation, Jesus appears in two different shapes, two different forms? Lois, the reason why he, they didn't recognize him depends on the context. Because number one, it says it was kept. They were kept from recognizing him, either because maybe he had veiled himself, meaning put on a veil like, a, like Moses did. Or because it was early in the morning and they weren't looking in his direction. Or because he was at a great distance away. Or he did change his form. Okay. Revelation 5, verse 6. Pray for Taylor and pray for all of us in Jesus' name. Revelation 5, verse 6. Okay, read with me. And beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Wait, I thought Jesus is a man. Why does he look like a lamb as an animal? As it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Jesus literally has a body of a lamb and literally has seven horns and seven eyes? Or is that how he manifested himself to John? Which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Google or user, when they give me that option, I will, brother. When they give me that option. D do you really believe that Jesus right now has a physical shape of a lamb? So he looks like a lamb in heaven and he literally has seven eyes with seven horns? Or is that the form he appeared temporarily because that image conveys a deeper spiritual truth and significance and meaning? Revelation 5 verse 6. Okay. But wait, earlier... Jesus appeared differently. Revelation 1, verses 12 to 18. Earlier, Jesus appeared differently. Watch here. Revelation 1, verses 12 to 18. I have no idea what you mean metaphor. Are you playing games with me? If he's appearing in a form, that means it's symbolic. It stands for something. So if you mean metaphor, stand for something, yes. I hope I don't have to explain even those terms, brother. Please be OB. Okay? Now watch John seeing Jesus. Now notice how Jesus looks. In Revelation 5, John saw him looking like a lamb, a young lamb, a male lamb, very young, with seven eyes and seven horns, and looked like his throat was slit because it said as if it was slain. But earlier, look how Jesus appeared to him. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and the midst of the seven candlesticks, candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So he sees someone looking human, one like the Son of Man. Watch the description. Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps around his chest with a golden girdle. Now watch here. His head and his hairs were white. What is Jesus doing with white hair? Why is he appearing as an older person, as an elderly person? They were white. Like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass. As if it were, watch. As if it were. <clears throat> burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Do you literally think Jesus in his physical glorified body that was raised has white hair, and he has a sword in his mouth, a literal sword in his mouth, and literally seven stars in his hand. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying <clears throat> saying to me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now notice for, verse 18. Notice verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, was dead, was dead, so this is Jesus, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So how does Jesus look like in heaven? Does he look like an older person, 
an elderly person with white hair and a white robe and a sword literally in his mouth and stars literally in his hand? Or does he look like a young male lamb with seven eyes and seven horns? What does he look like? What does he look like? And you think when Jesus rose from the dead in that physical body and he appeared to the disciples, he had white hair? Jesus, at the very most, would have been in his late 30s, early 40s. You think he had white hair when he appeared in his resurrected, glorified body? Johan, it doesn't matter, don't ask me, and sit back and listen. And zip the lip.com. Out of love, I say this to you. Okay. So now, how does Jesus look? Does he look like an elderly person with a little sword in his mouth and seven stars in his hand? Fiery eyes and his lower part of the body like burnished bronze? Or does he look like a young lamb, male lamb, with seven eyes and seven horns? Or do you get the point? Do you get the point? So Hafsa, he doesn't look like an elderly person. So he looks like a lamb. So when you see Jesus, it's going to be a lamb. That's what you mean. Johan, can you get out of here, bro? We don't like you. You're an agent of the devil, a tool of the devil, because you're a demon trying to distract. Get out of here, Johan. Stop pretending to be a Christian, you wicked tool of the devil. Yep. In Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days is the Father, but in Revelation 1, it's the Son. You with me there? Depend on what you mean by metaphorical. It's more appropriate to say symbolic. It's not metaphorical. Symbolic. He's appearing in these forms because these forms are symbols, signs to greater spiritual realities, meanings. Okay, so Anna, did that answer your question? So then if Jesus, let me see if you got it. I want to just make sure you're getting it. If Jesus is still a man, which he is, and he has a physical body that he raised immortal, it's deathless, and he has attached himself to that physical body, so that physical body is his forever. And in heaven, he's in that physical body that he made immortal. And he's sitting on a visible throne in that physical body. And you see Jesus in that physical body that he received from Mary that was nailed to the cross, buried, and then he raised immortal. How then, how then is he able to appear as a lamb in one scene, but as an elderly person in another scene with a sword in his mouth? Because as God, because remember, he's God. As God, he can appear in various shapes, various forms, at the same time, the world over. Do you understand the difference now? Yeah, but it's okay. Thank you. But you got it now, Anna? I know. I just want to make sure. So, folks, the Father... Because he's God, thank you, Muhammad Ibn Jaris. May the Lord Jesus bless you and preserve you. The Father, because he's God, can appear in millions of visible shapes and forms all over creation. So can the Holy Spirit. So can the Son. Because the three persons are God and can do whatever God can do. But Jesus as man, remember, thank you, Rotom. Only Jesus became man. Only Jesus has a physical body. The Father didn't become man, so he doesn't have a physical body. The Holy Spirit does, didn't become man, so he doesn't have a physical body by nature. Only Jesus became man, and only he has a second nature and a physical body that goes with that human nature. And in his physical body, he's in heaven on the throne, one place at one time. Clear? Clear? Did that make sense to you now? Yes. 
I can show you the Holy Spirit appearing in two different shapes at the same time. You want me to show you now the Holy Spirit? In Revelation, appearing as seven lampstands, right? And as seven eyes in heaven simultaneously. You want me to show you that too? Revelation 4, verse 5. Revelation 4, verse 5. Theophania. Theophania. Here, Revelation 4, 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are what? The seven spirits of God. So the seven lamps are the seven spirits of God. Now, this is in heaven before God's throne, Revelation 4, 5. But now go to Revelation 5, verse 6. Revelation 5, verse 6. And beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having, and I'm reading for the second part, seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, guys, I'm confused. The seven eyes on the face of the lamb are the seven spirits. But John just saw seven lamps that were also the seven spirits. So are the seven spirits seven lamps or seven eyes on the face of the lamb? Both. And the seven spirits refer to the Holy Spirit and its perfect work. Clear? Am I making sense or not clear? It's nonsense, Christian. A dog like you would think it's nonsense. And you can, guys, can you give me a chance to insult these filthy dogs and muzzle them and shame them and spit on them? Holy saliva. You guys are too quick. Calm down, man. Let me at least insult this filthy, blasphemous, satanic dog of the devil for the glory of Jesus Christ. And yes, folks, there's a time and place to insult and shame these filthy, wicked dogs, these filth of the devil for the glory of Jesus. Exactly, Frank Christian. Okay. Did everyone get it so far? Guys, honestly, I want to bless you and teach you and educate you as Holy Spirit enables me to speak truth without error and illuminates me to see the depth of Scripture so that he can use me to show you the depth of Scripture. But one thing I can tell you, and I pray the Holy Spirit will strengthen me, reinvigorate me, rejuvenate me, replenish me for the glory of Jesus Christ, that I keep enduring until Jesus takes me home, until he returns. Exactly, B.O.B. It is tiring. It is tiring when, and don't, don't misunderstand me, I am your servant, and I will serve you for the glory of Jesus out of love for Christ, okay? It is tiring when... I can't go into a subject because I have to go into all this background information and unpack all this necessary foundational truths because churches are not educating Christians. Thank you, King, and thank you, Zena, for your support. God bless you tremendously, right? Folks, what I'm teaching you is basics, stuff we all should have learned when we first came to the faith. But churches today are not doing their job. It's, it's sad. It's sad what the church has become today. That you need to go on YouTube and find Bible teachers to teach you the meat because your pastors or your priests are not doing it. Shame on them. Then what are they doing? What are they doing? You're called to full-time ministry to serve the church. You're called to teach the depth of Scripture and teach people how it applies to their lives. And be assured, this is the word of God, historically accurate, inspired, right? What are you doing? I, I don't get it. I, I really don't get it, man. Come on, man. So now you learned a lot, right? So what did you learn? Let's sum it up because guess what I'm going to do for you guys? If you're not tired and you're up because there's no live stream with David Wood, I'll do a second session right after this one if you're up for it. Are you up for it? Because we got about 200 trying to push that 300 mark, God willing. Cindy, thank you. God bless you.
because I was going to go live with David, but he got flagged and he can't do live stream for another week. So I'm going to do another session. Booyashaka. So it's 4 o'clock. Let's unpack this. Speak on a few more issues. And then I'm going to do a second session, Lord willing. Thank you, B.O.B. I need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will raise up people to bless you. So, folks, let me tell you about the two-fold blessing. How I pray I'm a blessing to you, but how you're a blessing to me. We're going to talk a little more about the angel Lord. And we're going to do another live stream on Hebrews 1 right after this. Right after this. When you seek the face of God, let me tell you something. When you seek the face of God, okay, and you ask God, Lord, I want to know you and I want to know your word. I want to know the Bible so I can know how to love you and know who you are and trust in you and live for you. And you seek his face and he answers you either by having you understand the scriptures by reading it or hearing it for yourself or by bringing you to teachers. Because Jesus Christ said he'll raise up shepherds after his heart. Jesus Christ said he'll raise up shepherds after his heart. If you are his flock, he loves you and he's almighty to preserve you and will not allow you to be misled by wayward shepherds. He'll always intervene by his spirit to save you. So if you've been praying that and you came here, you're now blessing me. Because that is confirmation. Because, folks, I'm a sinner. I'm not better than you. I have issues and struggles and trials. And at times, let me repeat this. The Lord bear witness. I have absolutely no doubt the Bible is God's word. The God of the Bible is real. Jesus is alive. He's almighty. He is life. It's not make-believe. No doubt God lives. The Bible is his word. My doubts come from my own self-worth. And my value and whether God is pleased with me or whether I'm deceiving myself into thinking God is using me, though I disappoint the Lord Jesus. So I struggle with that because Satan wants me to struggle with that so that I can step away from doing the work that God has called me to because I start doubting myself. But when you show up, that's God also speaking to me. So it's not just me blessing you. It's you blessing me because then the Lord is saying, I will save you from your imperfections and moral failures. I will sanctify you. I will preserve you. You'll be covered by the blood and you belong to me. And I put you here to glorify Jesus till your last dying breath. So it's an encouragement to me. And I do need encouragement. Especially when I don't have my angels, my two precious daughters in my life. And it's been Almost a year. In fact, a year. Right? So thank you for blessing me and putting up with me in my imperfections. And may I continue to serve you for Jesus' sake till the Lord takes me home or until he descends. Okay, now that said, we're going to talk a little more about the angel of the Lord. And we're going to take a short break. And then we're going to do another session because there's no David Wood tonight. As we speak, a car accident. This state, notorious for the worst drivers in the world, God saved me from a car accident, from hurting someone or being hurt by someone. The worst drivers in the world right now, car accident right now, I'm looking right at it. May God have mercy on them. Anyway, a few more examples of the angel of the Lord, and I'm going to wrap it up, and we're going to do another session right after this. If you guys promise to come, we got 200. In fact, I want to see 300. Okay, now. Let's go to Genesis 48, verses 15 to 16. Because Peter, David Wood, his focus is different. Peter, David Wood's focus is to expose Islam, expose Muhammad as a filthy, wicked son of Satan, to destroy Islam so that Muslims can see how filthy Muhammad was and escape Islam and come to Jesus Christ. Okay. Genesis 48, verses 15 to 16. Let's read it. Please, happy, go lucky, contact me via email because, man, if you know what I'm going through, here, let me give you my email. Here it is. Sam underscore S-H-M-N at gmail.com and we'll talk. All right, Genesis 48, 15 to 16. Sorry, brother, make you post it again. Okay. 
Go ahead, bro. Four first last he's tired. Notice J J Jacob is going to bless Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Jacob is going to bless his grandsons. So he's invoking God, praying to God to bless the sons of Joseph, his grandsons. Notice his prayer, folks. Notice his prayer. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, who provided for me, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Whoa. The Hebrew verb, barach, bless, is singular. He says, God before whom Abraham and Isaac walked, is the God who redeemed me, fed me, and preserved me, and he happens to be the angel. The angel is the God of Abraham and Isaac. The angel is the God who has fed me all my life. He is that angel who is that God that redeemed me, and that angel who is that God will bless my grandchildren. Bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Do you catch how he prayed? He's praying to the God who fed him, preserved him, and redeemed him from all evil. And that God ends up being the angel. The God of Abraham and Isaac is that angel. The God who's fed me all my life is the angel. The God who redeemed me is the angel. And that angel will bless my grandsons the sons of Joseph. You caught it? Everyone got it or no? Who didn't see it? I don't want to move on if you didn't catch it. Can anyone explain to me why would Jacob identify the God of Abraham and Isaac, identify the God who fed him and preserved him all the days of his life as the angel who redeemed him, and then why would he identify the angel as the God who can bless his grandsons? I want it to sink in. That's why I'm pausing. Thank you. And I just showed you who that angel is. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that angel entered the womb of a blessed Jewish maiden, a virgin, and took a physical body and human nature from her blessed womb, her consecrated belly made holy by the Spirit, and became a human baby, a human child, a human man with a flesh and blood body. And then he died in that body, and then he raised that physical body and made it immortal and deathless. And he's now known as the God-man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let it sink in for a minute. Yes, it did, Road FFM. Those who wanted to affirm a unipersonal God had a hard time with these passages. But the evidence shows that before, during, and even after the time of Christ, you had a large segment of Jews that knew there was more than one divine person in heaven, what they called two divine powers in heaven. Final example, folks. Final example. And we're going to <clears throat> shut down this stream, and God willing, start in 20 minutes. But I want you to come back if you can. I know some of you got to go to sleep and invite more people. Let's hit 300. For the glory of Jesus. All right. Final example. Are you ready? Are you ready for the final example? Here, we're going to do it. You ready for the final example? Okay. We're going to break it down into two segments. Genesis 16, verses 7 to 9. Genesis 16, verses 7 to 9. We're going to break it down into two segments. Thank you, Peter. Lord bless you, my brother. Okay. And the angel of the Lord Jehovah found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. Right? And he said, Hagar, who found her? 
This is Hagar. She's running from Sarai. The angel of the Lord. Guys, pay attention to the language. It's the angel who found her. And he, the angel said, Hagar, Sarah's, Sarai's maid. Whence camest thou? Where are you coming from? And whither wilt thou go? And where are you going? Where are you coming? Where are you going? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. Okay. Now watch verse 9. And the angel of the Lord, Jehovah, said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. Guys, is it clear? The narrator, Moses, says the angel speaking to her. Notice verse 9. The angel of Jehovah, the messenger of the Lord, is speaking to her. Not God the Father, but the angel. Not God the Father, but the angel, right? Do you see it, guys? Please make sure you see it or you're not going to get the point. The angel, not God the Father, is speaking to Hagar and says, Return to Sarai, your mistress. Okay, because I want you to help me understand verse 10. Genesis 16, verse 10. Help me understand verse 10. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. One more time. Post Genesis 16, verse 10, one more time. I, the angel speaking now, the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed. I will create offspring for you. I will create life in your womb and give you children. I will do it. I, the angel, will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Who does this angel think he is that he can take Hagar and give her a physical son and from that physical son create multitude of human descendants that can't be counted? Who does this angel think he is? Because he's claiming to create and give life. And he claims the ability to give you multiple human descendants that can't be numbered. One more time. Genesis 16, verse 10. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. <whistles> Notice he's the angel of the Lord, messenger sent by the Lord. So they're distinct, but then he does what only the Lord God can do. Now let's read 11 to 13. 11 to 13. Watch here. Verses 11 to 13. And the angel of the Lord sent unto her, Behold, thou art with child. How did he know? And shall bear a son. How did he know it wouldn't be a daughter? He knows she has a baby in her womb. And he'll be a son, a male child, not a female. How do you know this angel of the Lord? And you shall call his name Ishmael. Because the Lord Jehovah hath heard thy affliction. Hmm. But now watch this. And then the Lord, who is this angel? This Lord is the angel. The angel who is the Lord tells her what kind of child he'll be. And what his future will be like. He tells her. What kind of child he'll be and what his future will be like. He's telling her the future about this child before the child is even born. And he knows the gender of the child in her womb. Wow. And he'll be a wild man, meaning he won't be tamed. You can't tame him. You can't domesticate him. You can't control him. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren, in the face of his brethren. Now watch verse 13. And she called the name of the Lord Jehovah that spake unto her, You are the God that sees me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that sees me? Wow, to the max. Let's look at Genesis 16, 13 again. This should make you go, wow, wow, wow. Notice Genesis 16, 13. It says, and she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her. But folks, verses 7 to 12 says it was the angel that spoke to her. Now the narrator, Moses, says the angel that spoke to her was Jehovah God. When the angel spoke, Jehovah spoke, 
And what did she call the angel? You are the God that sees me. For she said, have I actually looked on him who sees me? The God who's all seeing, I actually saw him. The God who sees all and sees me and my affliction, I got, got to see him and speak to him and he spoke to me. <whistles> Three sixteen. I challenge to spit on you and bury you for being the filthy dog of Satan. And I'll gladly take you up right now. What's your religion? So I can have you call in so I can embarrass you and your false God by the grace of Jesus Christ. What's your religion? 316. Another dog of the devil barking at his master, Jesus Christ. And as a servant of Jesus, I will muzzle him for the glory of Christ. What's your religion? You rabid, demonized dog. Stop acting tough. No, tell me what your religion is. You're a child of the devil. God has nothing to do with you. What is your religion? So I can know how to decimate you and your false God by the grace of Jesus, who's God Almighty. So I know how to answer you and show the scripture. What is your religion? Stop barking. You just said you'll debate me, and I'm taking your challenge because I'm going to have you call me on Skype so I can decimate you and your false God. What is your religion, child of the devil, child of Satan? One more chance, or we're going to send you back to Asheron. Okay, send this dog out of here. The coward won't. See, they bark at their master, but they don't know that their master raises up his servants to silence these rabid dogs who bark at Jesus. Send them out of here now. Okay, now you guys with me. Do you understand whom Hagar saw? In Genesis 16, 7 to 14, Hagar saw the angel of Jehovah. Hagar said, seeing the angel is seeing the God who sees me. And she was astonished. I saw the God who sees all. I saw the God who sees me. I saw the God who saw my affliction and came to my aid. Why would she call the angel God? And why would Moses, the narrator, say when the angel spoke to her, that was Jehovah speaking to her. And why did the angel say I, the angel, will give you a son, Hagar. You have a son in your womb. You're going to give birth to a male child. And how did the angel know what kind of child he would be, what his character would be like, and what his future would be? And how could the angel say, I will give you from this child multitude of human descendants? Why does the angel think he's God Almighty who can create and give life who knows all things and sees all things and can tell you the future before it happens. Can you explain that to me? What more proof do you guys need that this angel is not a creature? He's God Almighty. Sent by God to be God's messenger. So he is an angel in role, in function, not by nature. He's not a creature created to be an angel. And this angel is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Is that clear? Because I'm going to shut this down and we're going to do another live stream in 30 minutes. Clear? And folks, let me tell you, you blaspheme God and his word, I'll either block you or I'm going to silence you. You mock the Lord and his word, and you try to rob Jesus of his glory, don't be upset Then I treat you the way you deserve. Calling you a dog, a swine, a fool, all of which is biblical, because you will not rob Jesus of his glory, blaspheme my Lord Jesus, and try to demote him, for your false satanic doctrine, your teaching from the pit of hell, I will treat you the way you deserve, just like Jesus and his disciples, his apostles, and the prophets did to blasphemous swine who sought to rob God of his glory. Right? Is that clear? 
So you guys ready for a second session? You sure? Guys, please don't let me start a session if you're not coming because I know some of you are tired. You're going to sleep. But hopefully we'll get more people, not less. Everyone ready for a second session? This time I can go to Hebrews 1. Okay, Lord willing, it's now 4.21 p.m. 5 p.m., 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, meaning in 29 minutes, 5 p.m., 8 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time. 8 p.m., 5 p.m., my time, 8 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, 29 minutes, we go live. Is it 40 minutes? Oh, I'm sorry. See, that just tells you I don't know math because I'm stupid. Okay. No, what do you mean 40? Yeah, 39 minutes. Yeah, 39 minutes, not 29 minutes. 39 minutes because it's now 422. 5 p.m., my time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, less than 39 minutes. Let's rock and roll. Lord Jesus willing, we'll be back. Invite people. Don't break my heart. I want it to be more than 200 or I'll start crying. Okay? Boy, is the sun getting to me. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Lord Jesus.